Thank you, and thanks for the introduction. Yeah, um, my name is Felix Arns, and we're going to talk about tackling performance in the WordPress ecosystem at scale. Um, we're not going to really do that right now because it might take a while, but we're going to look into what it takes, what it takes to get to that. Um, yeah, you already heard a little bit about me. Um, I am a WordPress core committer. I've been a WordPress core committer for about six years now. I'm um, also a musician, movie geek. Um, and I'm passionate about web performance in general. Um, I'm also an optimist, which I think you sometimes have to be, when, especially when you want to optimize performance in an open source CMS like WordPress. Um, you can find me mostly under my full name on social media, but in WordPress, it's Flixos90. Um, but let's get started now. So why do we need to care about performance? WordPress sites are slow. like. Sometimes that slow. Um, but I mean, you've probably heard that before. So what does, what does it really mean? It's, I want to really emphasize that this is just not empty complaints. Like, we can look at some facts. You may be familiar with um, Core Web Vitals or short CWV already, but I'm just going to quickly recap what they are. So Core Web Vitals are comprised of uh, three key metrics that represent different aspects of performance. Um, those names may seem a bit hard to parse, but actually what's behind that, behind them, is not that complex to understand. So first, LCP is basically how, the, how fast the page loads. Um, I think that is what a lot of us really think about what is web performance. Um, and while one may argue that it's maybe the most important of all of these, but it's, it, I want to really highlight that it's not the only thing that matters for performance. So LCP is how fast the page loads. Um, the other two are FID and CLS. Um, FID, um, first input delay, is essentially how fast the web page responds to user interactions. So for example, when you scroll down, when you scroll just when you scroll down and it lags, or when you click something and it only reacts after two seconds, like that would be a bad FID. And CLS is how stable the layout is. Um, cumulative layout shift, that sounds a bit complicated, but um, it's, it's basically how, it's basically about that page elements should not move unexpectedly without which means basically without any user interaction. So that's easy, easily outlined with an example. You've probably all had this experience somewhere where you on your phone and maybe the connection is not so good or maybe the website is just really terrible and you want to click a button, but just as you click on the button, it shifts down and you click on something else, often an ad. So that is, that is what really makes for bad CLS score. So um, each of these metrics has some thresholds defined for which, yeah, which, which values are considered good or poor. Um, but, I, but there's also the overall Core Web Vitals assessment. It really, it only, it has, um, a site only passes the overall Core Web Vitals assessment if all three values are good. So you can just have like, a, I don't know, fast loading website to have to get good core web vitals, it has to be good in, across all of these three to have a great performance and great user experience. So how are WordPress sites doing in that regard? The answer is, you guessed it, not that good. Um, to be fair, WordPress has a great FID um, passing rate and CLS is okay, but LCP, so loading performance, which is one of the most important aspects, especially when, just, when you just land on a website, it's really not good looking that good. Um, seeing the 35% here basically means that 65% um, of all WordPress sites out there load their main content too slowly um, to provide a good user experience. And we've probably heard before that that's one of the, that's one of the causes that, people, that, that leads people to leave your website before they even start browsing your content. And you lose potential clients, potential customers. So yeah. The 35% here is really, is really one of the main things we need to focus on when we look at um, WordPress performance. Because of these three metrics, LCP is also really the main one that drags down overall Core Web Vitals um, passing rate, which is only at 28.4% on mobile as of July this year. Um, 
On desktop, it's only marginally better with 32.3%. Per, um, to provide a bit more context where this data comes from, it is sourced from uh, HTTP Archive and the Chrome UX report, both of which are public data sets that anybody can query. Um, you can explore all of that data yourself. Um, and yeah, one of the good entry points is the cwbtech.report URL here that's linked. Um, that's essentially where all this exact data comes from. But the whole data sets there are public and um, yeah. So um, I also, another thing I also want to highlight is briefly looking at other CMSs. Um, the passing rate, there, there is, first of all, the LCP metric is um, generally the one that is the worst. So that's not only a WordPress problem, to be fair, but WordPress is, even compared to other CMSs, particularly yeah, scoring low in that, in that one. Um, and for example, um, I want to highlight, one, one thing to highlight is uh, Typo3, for example, has an overall um, CWB passing rate of around 60%, so that's like more than double the one of WordPress. So with this background, let's now look at um, what WordPress has been doing recently in that regard and what we need to focus on to improve the situation. You may or may have not heard about the WordPress performance team, which is a relatively new team. Um, the WordPress performance team is a dedicated working group to tackle monitoring, this is essentially our mission statement, to tackle monitoring, enhancing and promoting performance in WordPress core and its surrounding ecosystem. The team was uh, kick-started in late 2021 in a collaborative effort. Um, it's spearheaded by different contributors from uh, various companies, including Google, which is where I work, um, Yoast, TenUp, XWP were other companies involved in that. Um, and we got support from the community right away. Like there were a ton of super excited comments on this first proposal post. Um, and shortly after we started having weekly Slack meetings, which we've had ever since. Um, and then earlier in 2022, we established the Performance Lab plugin, which is a, a new, yeah, a relative new plugin, which I'll tell you more about in just a bit. Um, then after a few months of the successful collaboration, um, the team was really formally established as an official part of the WordPress project in July. So there is now, we have now our own website, make.wordpress.org slash performance. Um, this is going to really be the entry point for everything around this team. It's currently heavily being worked on, so there is not that much content yet, but bookmark this already if you're interested. This, is the best, this will be the best way to get started. So what are the goals of the WordPress performance team? Um, it can be broken down into three things. First, we want to improve performance at scale through WordPress core enhancements and fixes. So, while such efforts, um, they often take really long because of all the backward compatibility of ed and edge cases that we need to consider, it also means anything that we can land in WordPress core, it goes to every WordPress site in the whole world, those that update at least. Um, in addition, we want to work on tools that make it easier for developers to, yeah, to monitor performance and to make decisions based on performance metrics. So that's both for the development of core plugins and themes, but also for, yeah, when your code is used in the production, in production sites in the wild. So there's, there's um, so-called lab metrics, which is when it, essentially when you run an experiment and you, um, you let's say you, code, you develop a, an, what you think is a performance enhancement, and then you have to compare how it's been working before and after. That's kind of a lab test. But then you also need to look, once you have launched this thing, or maybe made it in a beta, put it in a beta testing plugin or something, um, how it's really performing across at scale, like across websites. And that's where, um, yeah, tools is like, especially tools like HTTP Archive or, um, or the Chrome User Experience Report um, can be helpful. So um, the last point is just, yeah, we want to generally raise more awareness of um, performance during development and, um, yeah, like other general areas like security, accessibility, performance needs to really be an integral part of all phases of development. Let's look into each of these three in a little bit more depth. So the primary project that the WordPress performance team has been working on is the Performance Lab plugin, which I already mentioned before. Um, this is not your regular performance plugin, though. It's, um, it is effectively a beta testing plugin, which um, is for 
performance-related feature projects. So WordPress 4 has for a long time had this concept of feature projects. And um, yeah, we have essentially established this plugin to make it uh, easier to work on any performance-related feature plugins, feature projects, which are included in this plugin as modules, as individual modules. So it's essentially a bundle of different performance features that each of which we hope to eventually get into um, WordPress core. And yeah, you've, I don't, this is similar to, for example, if you've used Jetpack before, like you have individual modules in that single plugin. Um, yeah, and by having all this in a single plugin, it makes it easier to maintain from a development perspective, but it also makes it easier for end users to test because they just have to install this one plugin and they don't have to keep up with all the other things that are happening in WordPress core and which plugins are possibly there. Um, and it also makes it easier to monitor performance um, because we've built infrastructure into this plugin, which, for example, um, outputs a meta generator tag similar to WordPress so that we can uh, use tools like data sets like HTTP archive to um, compare and assess performance in the, from sites that use this plugin. So that leads us to the making decision, making metric-based decisions. Um, this is a key aspect where we, as our ecosystem, have a lot to learn. The WordPress ecosystem has a tendency to decide things on like arbitrary beliefs and experiences, um, like this 80% rule. But do we really know whether 80% of the sites like will need this feature or not? And and we have, sometimes we don't really have a way in WordPress to get this information because of the lack of telemetry, which is perfectly fine. Um, but we also have to be honest with ourselves, like saying doing XYZ, XYZ will improve performance doesn't necessarily mean that it will actually improve performance. So when with performance, we are in a unique position to make metric-based decisions because we have certain, we have tools available, we have data sets available, and um, yeah, the performance team, is, we, want, we really want to work on making this more um, accessible, I guess, to the, yeah, to the WordPress ecosystem. And um, we also want to start writing documentation on how you can, for example, use, how you can query HTTP archive to, to get specific metrics that you're interested in for a certain feature that you may be building. Um, yeah, as mentioned before, all these tools, they are publicly available. So, um, you should, you should have documentation for this very soon so anybody of you can also start using that. And then this aspect of being, making metric-based decisions is an important thing that I would love for us to embrace more as a community. But there are other, other ways where we can increase, increase performance awareness. For example, members of the performance team recently, um, yeah, including myself, started proposing a WordPress performance checker, a, a plugin checker. And um, the plugin, like you may have heard that there is already a theme check tool. It has been out there for years. Um, so theme developers can use this tool to find violations in their code, to scan their code for problems. And um, while this is somewhat more complicated for plugins, because plugins can kind of do anything they want, we do think there is, there is definitely value in this. And we also do think that this is possible to, to build. And, um, if we have a plugin checker, we can assess, we can, we can basically warn and inform developers as they're de de building their plugins about um, potential issues relating security, um, accessibility, but of course also performance. Um, so that's something that we want to really kickstart very soon. Um, other than that, we also, there are other ideas what we could do, for example, um, there is already a, a security section in the plugin developer handbook, but there is no performance section. So maybe there's also a lot of documentation where we can help plugin developers to learn more about those best practices. To end this section about the WordPress performance team, I'd just like to highlight some of the um, greater WordPress core projects that the team has been currently working on. Um, using on all of these are part of the performance lab plugin. So that is used as a testing vehicle. Um, to highlight one of them, uh, just, just this week, actually, we got the latest WebP uploads feature committed to WordPress core. Um, and based on, yeah, data from the Chrome UX report, this will help almost 80% of WordPress sites out there to improve their LCP metric. 
by using that more progressive WebP image format. OK, so much for the current progress of the WordPress performance team, but let's now focus on a bit more long-term thinking here. It's great that we now have the performance team, but to be truly successful in improving performance at scale, we must understand the challenges of our ecosystem, and we need a shift in mindset to think about the performance in WordPress. Some of this may not be new to you, but let me highlight the four challenges we have in our WordPress ecosystem when it comes to performance. First, WordPress and most, open other, most other open source CMSs for that matter, they are distributed, so you can host them anywhere. Um, and while there is a number of, um, of hosts out there, and it's more and more, there are more, more and more hosts out there that optimize specifically for WordPress, that's always still a one-way optimization. Like WordPress itself still has to work on any host out there. So, yeah, this way, um, this way you basically, yeah, that makes it really hard because you have to satisfy a ton of edge cases. And what if certain hosts may not support the best latest technology? And this is always a big challenge to advance performance in WordPress. The second challenge, though, which is more specific to our ecosystem, is the lack of quality assurance. So the plugin and theme repositories, they're essentially a free for all. And that is great. While that is great to have, um, especially like it's great to have no, no unnecessary roadblocks in your way, especially when you're a new WordPress developer. Um, but there is the fact that, yeah, there you have, there's basically little to no control and not even assessment on quality. So that means it leads to two problems. As a developer, you just don't learn about anything. Like you don't improve. You, 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 don't, you don't find out that your plugin may have problems. And then as an end user, you have basically no idea how you can, yeah, what, how you can assess a plugin. Like if you want to find a plugin for a certain purpose and then you have 20 different plugins to choose from, you don't really know which one of these is good and which one isn't. Um, that also then indirectly leads to the third challenge, um, Many WordPress plugins, and sometimes even themes, um, compete against each other simply by the number of features that they offer. And that results then in bloated solutions, which makes performance even worse, or at least even harder to get good performance. And then due to the lack of quality criteria for plugins and themes um, that are shown to end users, that's really the, the only thing that end users can look at. And um, I understand if you're a plugin developer today, that yeah, this this is maybe the way to get to get users to get potential customers. But we also, I, this is also really this is how the WordPress ecosystem works today. But I think we need a shift there. Like we should we need to focus more on yeah quality assessment. And then last but not least, there is just the sheer size of the WordPress ecosystem. I don't even know anymore at this point how many like, plugins and themes there are, but it's, it's definitely more than 60,000 just on WordPress.org alone. And then even think about all those other marketplaces that there are outside of WordPress.org. So this ecosystem size of WordPress simply scales all the other three problems to massive dimensions. So what can we do about all that? mentioned, um, we need to educate developers on performance best practices. And this is that the performance team has already started focusing on. We also need to establish quality guidelines. And enforcing them would, of course, be a great potential goal. But even encouraging them would be a great start. This then also relates to the, first, to the third point here. Um, we need to make performance and incentive that is worth focusing on for plugin and theme developers. Um, I know that enforcing, I mean, while, while I, I personally, I would be open to enforcing certain quality guidelines, but that can be seen as somewhat controversial in the ecosystem. Um, so while enforcing may be a bit of a stretch, um, I think we could still, yeah, we could still um, reward plugins and themes that do the right thing, for example, there could be um, a badging system in, in the plugin and theme repositories for plugins or themes that, yeah, follow, cer like, fo follow certain best practices. Um, and then this way, it would help site owners make a more educated decision 
one which plugins to choose for a certain use case. And at the same time, it would give the plugin and theme developers, yeah, it would allow them to also to improve that, to improve their plugins to essentially, to eventually also get these patches. But the most important point, which I want to highlight in this session, is the last one here, um, automating performance fixes. All of the other three points, they are important, but I think this one, it takes just special priority, especially because, the massive, because of the massive ecosystem that is WordPress. Realistically, the number of WordPress plugins and themes is so extremely large that no matter how much we educate, encourage quality guidelines, and make performance an incentive, we can only get so far because even if we went all the way in with, um, with the WordPress plugin and theme repositories, for example, think about all those infamous third-party marketplaces which may not do that. And then um, these efforts may be completely remain ignored, and, but still those some of these marketplaces um, have plugins and themes that are widely used. And um, we have to be also be honest with ourselves, like how many of the, of the WordPress developers and out around the world do we think really read WordPress.org regularly or follow the best practices? Like I mean, all of us here probably do, but there are so many, there are so many developers out there that will not know about any, any of what we're doing here. So, we need to really, um, yeah, we need to really find ways to, in WordPress to fix performance in WordPress core in a way that does not require all of these 10,000s of plugins to use a certain API or to opt into a certain behavior. Basically, we need to enhance WordPress core that it fixes the mistakes that the plugin or theme developer make. So this may sound crazy, but I'd like to think that I like us to think about that a little bit more. We can indeed get quite far by investing in all of the different ways to improve performance that I've mentioned. Who knows? Maybe we can get to like a 40, 50, maybe even 60 percent CWV passing rate eventually. But having core identify and solve performance problems out of the box is what I think maybe the only way to get to even higher numbers than that, like to the 70, 80, 90. I mean, 100% is a bit of a stretch, but you get what I mean. So let's look into this idea a bit more. A first principle we should start doing is wherever possible, use smart defaults. When we think about defaults today, we tend to automatically gravitate towards a single default value, but it does not have to be just a single value. We could instead add logic to compute a dynamic default value based on certain heuristics. For example, um, when we introduced lazy loading in WordPress 5.5, we initially went with that more naive approach where the default for lazy loading an image was simply true. Like every, Im every content image was lazy loaded out of the box. And then we advised theme developers to customize their behavior based on the theme layout because one thing that is, one thing that is discouraged is to lazy load images which are in the initial viewport. But then, um, of course, not every theme in the world will adopt this, um, will, t will take care of this. So after some time after we launched this, we noticed that there was a regression in LCP, actually. This feature was launched. Of course, it had still other benefits um, to have lazy loading, but the LCP metric itself partially regressed because of this feature. Um, and that was because of this default being simply true, and we basically left it to theme developers to fix it, to, to adjust it based on their theme layout. So we then did several analysis with different ideas on how we could set some de default value dynamically, and we compared them um, to find one that works reliably, re reliably at scale. So we, com we, we wrote, um, we wrote a different patches, and um, we compared them across uh, 100 different themes, 100 different of the most popular themes to see kind of what, which one works best across all of them. And then that one was shipped in WordPress 5.9, and essentially now that means it, it's now doing the right thing without requiring developers or site owners to intervene. When implementing those smart kinds of defaults, um, we, have to, we have to keep in mind, though, that they still are defaults, and they still have some room for improvement. Um, 
even when, yeah, when we tested this with like 100 themes, um, there was an improvement for, for most of them with the version that we eventually went with. But there were other, also a few themes which maybe had more unique layouts that were not, um, that would not benefit from this. So they, and in any case, there always needs to be a way for an individual developer to go in and maybe optimize even more for their specific site. So really, I want to call out that even those smart defaults, they should remain defaults. So, and because they are based on logic, it may just need to be, require a bit more thinking on how you can make these overridable because it's not just a single value. Sometimes um, it may help introducing an extra filter, for example, with lazy loading, then we introduce this filter there where you can control for every individual image whether it should be lazy loaded or not. So this way, eventually, the developer can go in and has full control to make this even more optimal for their site. I mentioned before that we did some analysis to find a good heuristic. But yeah, let's be real. It's unlikely, even for smart defaults, to cover every possible use case out there. So we should be focusing on the following two points, like the default logic, it should result in a notable performance improvement for the vast majority of sites. Think about maybe at least 70, 70 or 80% of WordPress sites. But then the remaining WordPress sites, of course, they could still be optimized further, but it would probably re require manual optimization because they behave in two specific, yeah, Two edge, maybe yeah, two unique and edge case ways that we can't address it in a universal way. But the main thing about if for those sites is, for at least those should, they should not see a performance regression. So whenever we build something like this and find a heuristic, we need to make sure we find a heuristic that improves it for the majority, but for the ones that it doesn't improve, it keeps it at the level that it was before. So to define a heuristic that satisfies these requirements, it is critical to validate the behavior then afterwards also on real world sites and using field metrics from tools like the Chrome UX report. One of the biggest challenges with these smart defaults today, though, is that WordPress content is generated on the server side in PHP. This means we have no idea on how that content is interpreted and loaded on the client side. And we also don't have any reliable information on certain aspects like um, the viewport size. So that has been also a significant drawback in this lazy loading um, effort because the WordPress, it's about the viewport, which image should not be lazy loaded. So we, but we could only use the server side to make some guess basically about it. And that's why we needed to do this, this whole analysis. So, Let's say a WordPress user publishes a, new, publishes a new page today. And then several users visit this page after it's published, where WordPress simply serves the page from the server side um, at its best capacity, but probably not fully optimized. Let's dream here for a moment. Imagine we had a mechanism there, like some background script that ran in the front end of the WordPress site to gather relevant client heuristics. And then this data could be sent to the REST API, to a new WordPress REST API endpoint, where it would be processed and then stored in the WordPress database. Then, subsequent requests, um, for subsequent requests, WordPress could use this information to serve the page content in an optimized way. This may sound crazy, and of course, there would be several complexity involved in this, like um, around security, around um, around storage, about the different viewports, so responsiveness. Um, but I also think what that here would enable for WordPress and all sites out there um, is, is, would be massive. Like many, many, so, many, um, so many different optimization techniques for performance require client awareness, um, like critical CSS, deferring JavaScript, resource prioritization in general, but also lazy loading images, like I already said, could be optimized even more with that, just to give you a few examples. I told you I'm an optimist, but I truly believe that we can achieve something like this, not next month, 
And maybe not even next year, but I think we can work towards it from now on. Of course, this requires a mind shift. Um, we need to really try things, and we need to also be prepared for failures, but we must also we must avoid shutting down those types of ideas before they're even attempted. Um, I'd love for you to think about these ideas and paradigms further. Let's start focusing more on ways that we can fix things in core out of the box without requiring every plugin and theme developer to, yeah, to, to use a certain API. What I really want to convey is APIs should still be part of the solution, but they should not be the full solution. Especially in regards to the last point, let's brainstorm this further. Um, I'd love to hear your ideas about that. Of course, also your concerns. Um, we need that too. But let's just not go into this like, yeah, there's no way we can get this into WordPress core. We need to think big, like, like that big. <laughs> I hope I was able to spark some inspiration for you with those concepts. Um, if any of this resonates you, with you, please help us in the performance team. Um, there are many ways to support the efforts of the performance team. And really, I want to emphasize right now, is only the beginning. So anybody that contributes can really help shape the team and the roadmap. So going forward, the best entry point, um, like I already mentioned before, is um, the make wordpress.org slash performance website. Um, you, will find, you already find links here to everything else that's relevant to contributing to the team. And very soon, you will find a fully fledged comprehensive handbook with documentation, including onboarding. One of the best ways to familiarize yourself with the processes is to participate in our weekly Slack chats. Um, they happen every Tuesday at 15 UTC, which is 8 in the morning, uh, West Coast time. So get up early, please. We also have the WordPress slash performance repository in GitHub, which is home to the performance lab plugin development, but also that repository used for any kinds of discussions on issues around other aspects of the performance team as well. So here you can really contribute and to, your, to our future projects, but you can also propose your new ideas. And last but not least, please test the performance plugin, performance lab plugin, um, and provide feedback on the individual modules. So whether you can, you can do that through the WordPress support forums, reviews, or even by reporting bugs on GitHub directly. So even if you cannot, commit directly to contributing to the team, or if you're unsure where to start, this is an excellent way. Just testing the plugin is an excellent way to support the performance team. Um, and it can also be an entry point for more. I'd love to see you around in the performance team. Um, but also today, let's chat more if you're interested in any of this. Um, and I'm also going to be at the contributor day tomorrow. Um, we're going to have an area there where we're going to work on WordPress performance. So please join the contributor day if you're interested as well and help us yeah, to move things forward. That's it. Thank you. We have 10 minutes for questions. And we're also taking questions from the chat. Yes. So I work with Core Web Vitals quite a bit. And, and we're, we're very aware of how that works. How, how, we, uh, how our clients uh, have those metrics and, and make sure that they're up to speed. However, it also seems like at the same time, there's two separate rules for people. Like, there's the people that are already popular, Google, and all that stuff. And I don't feel like, like there's a certain threshold where it just doesn't make a difference on how terrible your performance is you're still going to rank higher in Google for those. And I'm just kind of curious how that conversation happens for, at Google for penalizing those people who really do have like uh, authority. But I, I mean, if you search chicken recipes, I can guarantee you that the number one thing on there doesn't pass core web vitals, right? They're just terrible performance. And I'm, I'm curious how that happens, how that, how that discussion happens. So let me see if we can understand what you're asking, which is how come there's a 
discrepancy between what Google says about performance in terms of how it affects your ranking versus what we see in the wild in an actual search. Okay, Felix? Uh, I, I can't really speak much to that <laughs> because I'm, I'm not part of, in, I'm not involved in this piece at all, like Google search or, or the ranking. Um, so from our, like I'm more, I'm, I'm, for me, from my perspective, it's really core web vitals are a way to measure performance and, um, and yeah, for me, the goal to get co good core web vitals would be to get a good user experience. Of course, it does affect ranking somehow, but I have no idea how. <laughs> right? Like, to me, Core Web Vitals, which most of our sites do hit those, right? But that's the incentive, right? Like, you're going to do better. Well, if you guys aren't talking amongst yourselves, um, <laughs> like, where's the incentive for us? <laughs> I mean, there are. I'm sure there are. There are people are talking about this. It's just not. It's it's just people in other teams of Google. Okay, and we have a question from the chat. So Scott Brim says he's in a debate with others about WordPress performance, and he's looking for either a link to your slides so he can reference those, or some written materials that you might be able to share. Um, okay, so Scott Brim is looking for links to share uh, where he can get your resources? Um, I, yeah, I will definitely publish the slides um, just yeah, later today, probably in the next hour. Um, and I share a link on my Twitter profile, probably. Then, so if you look at uh, Felix Arns on Twitter, um, then you, you should find that. OK, and then we had someone. OK, I'll have you next. And there was a lady over here on my left. Yes. Um, yeah, I just have a general question. If you were going to give advice to a team that was looking to just kickstart like an optimization assessment or a performance assessment on their product, on their WordPress product, where should the team start? Like, what's a good baseline to go with? It's a lot that you just mentioned. It's a lot to look at, but the team is just on the Okay, so how would a development team get started with performance. Is that what you asked? Yeah, what's a good place to start for specifically? Yeah, I think so. At the, I think one of the good ways to start is um, you could have, are you, you're asking specifically about a plugin, for example? Yeah, let's do like our, our WordPress Yeah, yeah. So if you, um, you could have, you could install the plugin on some test site and configure it with yeah, with different content, and I don't know. Of course, the plugin could do whatever, whatever. But you could basically have maybe even have multiple test sites with different configurations of the same plugin, which so, and then you can um, you can test the test the uh, test these pages with uh, tools like uh, Web Page Test or PageSpeed Insights um, to see yeah where are the where where are the violations and. Um, from there, of course, you all, one, 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 a little, one thing that may be a little complex there is to figure out, is, it, is this problem from, from your plugin or is it from WordPress core? Um, but in general, if you, the main thing there is that you would need to test this on a site where it's only your plugin and maybe um, a super minimal theme which has nothing in it so that the theme would not affect performance. Okay, and our questioner from over here. Hello, world. Hey. Uh, great talk. You had a section about automation. So in your opinion, what is the role of AI in WordPress? And do you think it could help us fix some of the technical debt that we have? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I, yeah, I, uh, I think that's something that, um, yeah, if I'm I'm personally not that uh, familiar with yeah with AI, but we, um, but I think there yeah if there is people that would contribute to the performance team, who have more of this background knowledge there, I would be super excited about that because I do think there is definitely a lot of opportunities for it. Okay, and over here. 
Um, I, I do actually, yes, not know about this right now, but you can come to the Google booth later and I'm sure somebody there will know. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, front row. Do you think it would be helpful or distracting to put performance measurement feedback in terms of environmental impact, in terms of incentivizing people towards trying to make their sites faster? Um, sorry, can you, can you say the first so part? Rendering a website takes energy. There's an environmental impact to oh. that. The internet itself is a major source of carbon emissions globally. Do you think that highlighting that in the way that we talk about performance might be a way to incentivize more people to take this seriously? Or do you think that would be a distraction? Um, I, I mean, I, don't, I definitely don't think it would be a distraction. I think it could definitely, um, yeah, definitely help incentivize performance. Second row, and then we'll take third row, and then the chat. Uh, I have a question similar to what you guys were about um, automating things. Do you think there's potential to eventually automate, like, secure, finding security issues and plugins and things so that we don't have to rely on plugin developers that maybe don't update their plugins anymore or? You know, you can't reach them for three months, and a bunch of sites are going to get hacked because you can't update the plugin. Is that something that maybe that's not the performance team's problem, but is that something that? Um, hmm. I mean, that does sound more like a plugin team perform issue. But we're speaking like yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I think. Right, right. I, I, I mean, I don't have a spontaneous idea about this right now, but I think that, um, yeah, I mean, that would be, that would definitely be worth looking into. Um, I, I guess I would, yeah, I'm struggling right now with the idea of, because that's so deeply in the, in the code base, you kind of need to scan the code base of the plugin to find certain problems there. So. I don't know how you would then automatically fix the code base of the plugin or something, maybe. <laughs> okay, third row. Um, in terms of between WordPress core plugins uh, and you know, like themes, what, from a site developer's point of view, what should you be looking for to optimize just from that kind of overall view? What is the, what is the worst offender for uh, for those core web vitals, what's the, what's the first thing we should look for in terms of what's taking too much time for them? Um, I think that varies a lot be, on, on different case-by-case -case basis. So I think that's where it's best to use one of these tools to run it, run it over your site and see what is what are the worst problems according to this, like web page test, page speed insights, again, are two of those tools that I would recommend there. And we are at time. Thank you very much. Hope to see you tomorrow at Contributor Day and the social tonight. And we'll be back here in 15 minutes for the next talk. Thank you.